Tonight, the real story behind one of the most moving images from the war in Iraq. All the family of Ali was killed is the tragedy of the, of the war. But is there hope for Ali? Also tonight, not in my backyard, the battle over asylum seekers. I've been called a bigger and I've been called a racist. Two protesters try living like refugees. I don't want to live with an asylum seekers on my doorstep. Real Story with Fiona Bruce. Good evening. We start with the real story behind one of the most telling images of the war against Iraq. A 12-year-old boy without arms stares at the camera, helpless and orphaned. It's a picture that's impossible to remove from your mind, and it's moved thousands to contribute towards appeals to help the injured children of Iraq. We'll have the latest from Baghdad on Ali Ishmael Abbas in a moment. But first, Vanessa Collingridge examines the reaction to the boy who's put a human face to the suffering of war. Her report contains some distressing images. These pictures of 12-year-old Ali Abbas in a rusty cot in a Baghdad hospital have done more than anything else to make us appreciate the devastation that modern war can bring to civilian bystanders. Medical supplies are short and there are rioters outside, but inside this Baghdad hospital, doctors do their best to keep Ali alive. It's the tragedy of the, of the war. His house and his neighbours and the houses of his neighbours and relatives was uh, attacked by a rocket, and all the family of Ali was killed. At 12 o'clock midnight, while they were asleep, the house fell on them, and his mother, his father, and his younger brother died. His mother was pregnant when she died. Ali's story has touched the hearts of millions around the world. Funds are being set up and aid agencies deluged with calls offering money and support. Many want him to be brought back to Britain for treatment. The amount that you'd like to donate, that's wonderful, thank you. The Limbless Association is one of the organisations taking donations in Ali's name. Over £100,000 has been pledged so far. Can I take your name? He's left on his own. I can't really begin to imagine the trauma and the feeling he would be having. People do respond to him and a story like that, and they feel in their heart it just mm -hmm. has moved us, and I think uh, will move, must have moved a lot of people. But Ali isn't the only victim of war. One young boy has already made the long and painful journey to Britain for treatment. 13-year-old Islam is one of hundreds who've been maimed by the war in Chechnya, a bloody conflict that's run for nearly 10 years. Oh He's cared for by Aslan, who's heavily involved in Chechen politics and whose identity we've hidden because, even in England, he fears for his life. He was walking with his, with his friend in his village and uh, near a Russian checkpoint, he found a stereo a small player, a Walkman, and uh, when he switched it on, it just blew up. He lost both his limbs and eyes. His friend who was with him, uh, he lost same both his hands and one eye. What can you do now that you couldn't do a year ago? Yeah, I mean, tell me what. He couldn't uh, eat properly before, and he's trying, you know, put his clothes on by himself and some other things. Islam's receiving dental treatment to rebuild his mouth after the explosion two years ago. Right. Shall we come on through? It's a costly business, but he's supported by a charity which helps civilian victims of the Chechen war. I'm just going to just pop you back in the chair a bit. When he's probably about 18 or so, we can then perhaps think of putting in a couple of implants. Right, but for the moment there is some kind of cosmetic um, procedure that you can do just to give him back his smile. Absolutely. So far, Islam has made three trips to the dentist. He's also received prosthetic limbs and help at a school for the blind. It's treatment he wouldn't be able to get at home. Islam was fitted with his artificial limbs here at the Queen Mary's Hospital in Roehampton. They've got more than 80 years' experience in dealing with amputees. But even so, is it always the best idea to bring victims of war back to the UK for their treatment? Rachel, this is much better than yesterday. It really is. Yeah. 
The staff have worked with patients from war zones in Ireland, Cambodia, Iran and Iraq. Good. I think using a child's picture in the paper is a very good idea to, to, to highlight the needs that are necessary and need to be solved in Iraq. But what I would like to see is that money not used just for one child, because there are so many children and adults in the same situation. And I would like to see the money used and more money collected to set up a service in Iraq. All right. We're wonderful things, human beings. Um, a lot of patients have said that they feel suicidal. I haven't had one commit suicide in all the years I've been treating them. You've got to help the patients through it. They do go through it, and they come out and they do very well on artificial limbs. Chris Moon lost an arm and a leg when he was clearing mines in Mozambique. Ali said that he's suicidal. He'll be suicidal if he doesn't get his artificial limbs. It is very difficult to try and understand how a young boy of 12 feels, particularly when he's lost his parents. I think the important thing is to give him hope, to let him know that he will be able to do what he said he wanted to do, which was to help people. Uh, he may be able to help people in a very different way than originally being a doctor, as he'd, he'd thought, but um, he can still achieve what he dreamt of achieving. I think it may be harder for him, but uh, I think that he must be given hope. One 11-year-old boy has been following Ali's story closely. Cornel Hariska Munn was born in Romania with no hands and a withered leg. He was brought back to Britain by an English couple when aged just 16 months. I like to play snooker. I like to play football as well. Basketball, swimming, drawing I like to do, and lots of other things. What did you think when you first learned about Ali's story? I've been born like this and I haven't known anything different. But what I've, got, what I've got to say to Ali is that keep on going, be determined and have a go at anything you want to. But it's going to be a whole new experience for him. But I still think he can get through it. Yay. Iraqi doctors treating Ali say that his wounds are now infected. And if he doesn't get access to modern drugs soon, he may not survive. Ali is hanging on to life, but only just. He lost both his arms when his home was bombed. He also lost his mother, his father, and his younger brother. Now he is dying because his terrible wounds are infected. Ali has septicemia. He told me he'd like to be flown to London for specialist treatment as soon as possible. His doctor fears without such help, Ali could well be dead within the week. Die with tomorrow and after tomorrow, anytime, die. I managed to keep him alive till now. Anybody who volunteered to take him away abroad by an aeroplane, he's welcome. Fighting in Iraq may be almost over, but wars do not simply end. They leave a terrible legacy, and Ali Ismail Abbas is part of it. If you want more information on Ali or any of the charities working to help the children of Iraq, visit our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash real story. The war in Iraq has focused attention once again on the issue of asylum seekers, often refugees fleeing conflict. In situations like those of Ali, most would agree he should be allowed to come here for medical treatment. But other cases are more controversial. Plans to turn a hotel into an asylum centre in Sittingbourne in Kent outraged many in the village. But would the protesters feel the same way if they knew what it was really like to be a refugee seeking help? Real Story put it to the test. What are we going to do? about asylum seekers. We've got enough, enough's enough. Sitting born in Kent, where at times this winter the issue of housing asylum seekers has raised the temperature to boiling point. So you don't care if people are being tortured? And... I don't care a sod who's being tortured. Like a lot of people in Sittingbourne, Sandra Kennett hates the idea of asylum seekers living on her doorstep. When the asylum seekers get in there, what would they be doing all day? It's very frightening, it's, it's a, a fearful thing. 
Mike Apps is just as unhappy. That is a problem, isn't it? It's our only hotel, it, it takes away our tourism, it takes business investment out of our town no, and the government sure. have done it without any consultation, any discussion. Every time someone voices their views, as I have done, you're immediately classed as a racist. But will a taste of life with asylum seekers change their minds? Has it got bones in it? Is it, is it, is it, got, is it got bones? No. Just one sugar for me, please, yeah. Yeah. Sittingbourne is one of a number of towns around the country that have been chosen as a possible site for an induction centre, housing asylum seekers. One plan is to house over a hundred of them here in this hotel. CCTV cameras have already been put up nearby. Sandra Kennett lives just a hundred yards from its front door. She says the scheme has already had a dramatic effect on the area. They said that it would make no difference to the prices or the selling of the property um, direct on the doorstep of the Coniston Hotel, which it has. Um, my house has been up for two weeks and I've had no phone call at all. I don't want to live with an asylum seeker on my doorstep, so obviously they feel the same way. Mike Apps has been drumming up support for the asylum seekers to be housed elsewhere. He says they should all be detained in secure accommodation, not in a hotel in the middle of a town where they're free to come and go. The asylum seekers be coming into the country, uh, being unvetted, unchecked, we need to keep up as much pressure as possible with letters to the government, letters to Tony Blair. Care in the community doesn't work in our own community. The people of the UK already know that, and the government know that, if they're honest to admit it, yeah? Then you're going to put someone who's been through hell in the middle of a community, in a strange land, when they can't talk their language, that compounds the problem and causes a danger, not only to the individual themselves, and to the community. But what if Mike and Sandra were asylum seekers themselves? Maybe they'd look at things a bit differently. They're off to find out. Last year, a record This morning, Sandra and Mike are joining other asylum seekers in the queue to enter Britain. Hello, good morning. Good morning. morning. And your name is? Uh, Mike Hatch, A-double-P-S. Once they've been checked by immigration, they come here for help and advice. There we are, Mike. I'd like to take this number and have a seat, please, and somebody will see you in a moment. OK. Hello. Hello. Your number, thank you. Take a seat. OK, welcome to Migrant Helpline. My name's Wendy. Just to let you know that we're not the police or immigration, we're actually a charity organisation that's here to help asylum seekers. Hello. Thank you. Take a seat. There's a common misconception that asylum seekers come into the country and they're given full benefits. They're actually given 70% of the benefits, of statutory benefits that are available to people. People are believing that asylum seekers are automatically given mobile phones, are given cars. None of this is actually true. Now Sandra and Mike have checked in at Dover, they're getting a lift with other asylum seekers to a local induction centre. This is where they'll stay for seven to ten days before they're given somewhere more permanent to live elsewhere in the country. There are over a hundred asylum seekers in the centre, most of them from Iraq. Many of them saying they left the country because their lives were at risk. As soon as they arrive, asylum seekers are told what their rights are here in Britain and their responsibilities. 
Something that is really important that you must do each evening that you stay here is to sign our register. You'll find that when you go for dinner at 6 o'clock each evening, when you go to the kitchen there will be a piece of paper with everybody's names on and you must sign against your name every 24 hours. It's the only way we have of knowing that you're here and that you still want our continued support. <coughs> we cannot hold spaces open. But some of them have already discovered that not everyone welcomes asylum seekers to Britain's shores. <laughs> I, I've been here nearly three days, but um, I, I didn't see a lot of people. But yesterday I went to Ashford in town centre. A lot of people, they stick their finger at me. It's very unfortunate that your first experience in this country was negative. And I hope, again, I say that we've been able to give you a, a, another side of that. And I hope when you're dispersed as well, you, you continue to meet other people who are, are a little more sympathetic to your, to your case. Have Mike and Sandra's sympathies changed? My views were that they come into this country, um, most of them would just let run loose, and, um, and the way they've actually explained everything to me today, it's made me change my views a little bit on the asylum seekers' um, situation. Yeah, it's a lot different to what I thought. The people I've met today, I've found friendly. I didn't feel threatened in any way at all. It's been an eye-opener in a lot of ways, actually being with the people, actually being alongside them. Like real asylum seekers, Mike and Sandra are now moving on to longer term accommodation. This weekend they'll be staying with asylum seekers and finding out what it's like to be strangers in another country looking for a new home. Hello. Yeah. All right. Meet the class. OK, All welcome, right. please. Lovely. Thank you very much. Come on in. Ta. Mike is staying with Sande Belenji. He's from the Congo. Like Iraq and Afghanistan, one of the top ten countries across the world from which asylum seekers come to Britain. Hello. His name is Aristote. Nice Hello. to meet you. All right. Hello, Didi. I'm Sandra. Hello. Hello, Didi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. All right. Oh. Well, it's good of you to invite me up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a couple of days to kind of see your part, get, get your story, that's what I'd like to do. Why have you come to England? Why? Well, I didn't choose to come to England. Right. I've been forced to come to England. Yeah. yeah. Um, due to the situation I went through. I've that before. Yes. <laughs> Titi Cassendo also comes from the Congo. She didn't choose to leave there either. Her husband comes from Rwanda, something that put both their lives at risk. Phew. Mm. The government was looking for the people are from Rwanda and there was, the population was killing them, burning them mm. outside, beating them. The only thing I, I want is to be far from danger, to stay where there is no danger for me, for my life. Sande Belenji was an officer in the Congo army and says he was sentenced to death for withdrawing his troops from the front line after they ran out of supplies. But the man in charge of the jail turned out to be one of his former recruits. Uh, I was lucky to find that he was the the commander of the prison. Sande was sent on a work party the next day and escaped. I was lucky, really lucky, because the guards who were supposed to look after the team were drinking. They were drinking. They were almost drunk. So that was... Uh, oh, and that's how you escaped from there? They escaped. They a small uh, ditch. Do you feel that, because you're an asylum seeker, do you feel the people here um, are different towards you because of this? You feel like you are not 
in your place, you know. What well, you're not welcome here. Yes, um, people you are against it. you because of. Yes, like in the bus, some people in the bus. Some people doesn't like to sit near you, you know. You can feel it if somebody doesn't like you. You mm -hmm. feel it. I saw on the TV. Um, an hotel was about to be transformed. Oh, that's my hotel. That's the one I'm fighting. Oh, really? Yeah. I see it on That's the Coniston. The yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. So where do we get the bus from now? This side, is it? Going yeah. back? Yeah. From you just feel okay. like you're attacked, you know? I just feel the same, like, as I was at home. I was attacked at home. When I came mm. here, they attacked me in different this uh, different way, you know. Yeah. It's just after one o'clock in the morning. I had a good chat. Seems a, a nice guy. He's got his young son here. His wife and uh, daughter and other son uh, in another part of Africa. And his eldest daughter is uh, in Canada. Uh, I think he said Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, because uh, they had to flee the country as well. Um, quite a harrowing story and you can understand why um, people in that situation want to leave the country. In this case, you know, it has, uh, it has helped me to understand somebody that is actually truly um, seeking asylum um, and I hope it does um, anybody else. Titi was happily married to a businessman in the Congo. She doesn't know where he is. Now she's living alone on benefits of 35 pounds a week. As an asylum seeker, she's not allowed to work. All my life has changed. I have to start a new life. If they can allow us to work, allow me to work, I can pay electricity, I can pay the house, I don't mind. But if I'm not working, maybe I can do everything. I can get my own money, and paying the electricity, paying the flat. Be free, be like everybody, you know. Sande now has refugee status and could work, but says all he's been able to find are temporary jobs. You haven't worked for two years, yeah? No. That's what you said. Mm. So, I don't know, where, what, what about agency work? Agencies, you go there maybe three days, four days, one, one day, that's, a, that's yeah. the problem, so. Yeah, I've been called intolerant, I've been called a bigot, and I've been called a racist, and by staying with Sanday, it's not something to prove to people uh, that I'm not any of these things. Ten thousand people applied for asylum in the UK last year. Not everyone come over on ferries or in lorries on boats. I fully understand that, but a high percentage did. And if you take that that tack, what you're saying there, I should accept every one of those people into my country. I understand what you are trying to say. It's okay. One out of ten will be hmm? something or bad guy, something like that. But you have to protect them. Wouldn't it be better, and would you mind being put in a secure place for a period of time, not forever, but for a period of time, until you were checked out to find out if you were legitimate? Would that cause you a problem? Uh, myself, uh, I don't think so. Myself, I don't think so. Because if your life has been threatened for one, two or three years, hmm, when you get to a safe place, Okay, you don't, you don't have any more fear, but the government has to check, has to cross-check, to investigate about you. They must, they must know who you are before they allow you to, to be free. Ah bon? Et maman ne sera pas la prière. But Titi doesn't want to be locked up in an asylum camp. Mm. They cannot take you and put you somewhere like... Mm. 
a center, just mm. staying there. Once they, they, they put you in that house and giving you food only and uh, clothes, as a person, you will need to, to go out and get the fresh air, you know, be free, because you are a person. Yosefi Monana Yakobo, Wasili Kote Kaye. The only place Titi says she feels free at the moment is her church. This morning she's invited Sande, Mike, and Sandra to come too. We're going to pray this, for this country because it's an asylum country, which has opened the, the door for us. And Titi believes Britain will have to continue keeping its doors open to more and more people like her and Sande. The only solution to stop the asylum and refugee is that they cannot go to the war. Because when they are going to the war, they have to be prepared to receive more asylum, more refugee in this country. <laughs> The thing is, when you are persecuted somewhere, you must go somewhere else. And this country has agreed when they signed the Convention of Geneva. They said, OK, we should protect people. Last week, Mike and Sandra's campaign to stop the asylum center was successful. The government accepted the protesters' appeal. We won. We've actually got our hotel back. <laughs> but many people on the demonstration weren't just fighting to save the hotel. They were against any asylum seekers coming to their town. So after living as refugees, how do Mike and Sandra feel? If they were all like um, Titi in her circumstances, then I would feel them fine. And I, I would want the ones actually like Titi there that are, are legitimate. At the church service, I found that quite emotional. And realising that the, a lot of families have been split up and children are still lost, husbands and wives are still lost, people don't know if they're alive. You can't not be affected by that. You, you can't. You'd be absolutely heartless if you weren't. Um, and I'm glad the camera wasn't in there when I shed a tear. I would still protest in regard to the hotel, but I wouldn't go on a protest saying, keep them out of my town. Tonight, the Home Office say that although plans to open an asylum centre at the Coniston Hotel in City Vaughan have been dropped, they're still firmly committed to opening a national network of induction centres. That's all for now. There's no real story next week because of the Easter holidays. But join me in a fortnight's time for a special programme from the Armadillo Centre, Glasgow, Clash of the Cities. It's a unique opportunity for you to have your say on which British city should be declared European Capital of Culture 2008. Until then, thanks for watching. Good night.